we're uh, giving a little break this week and next. So we're wrong. So we're going to do something different or new, I guess, here at the community. Uh, next Sunday, Tyler will preach. But we will give you the text that Ron will be preaching the Sunday after that. So that you can have a week to study and meditate and pray on the text that he will, that will be coming up in the next week. And then when you get here that Sunday when Ron preaches, we'll have a handout for you with some outline and some notes. Because if we're going to be a church that is uh, expository, we're, we're, we're preaching and teaching in an expository way, then we also want to be a church that is an expository listener. So we want you to know what is coming up so that you can pray on that, and study that, and meditate on that. And then when you get here, so you can follow along in the best possible way that we can present to you uh, so that you can uh, worship and grow. So with that in mind, um, I don't have this. I don't have a handout. Uh, but if you want to turn to Psalm 27. Evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of my days, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, or you who have, oh you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, and the Lord will take me in. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for a false witness has risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and we thank you for a gorgeous day that you've allowed us to have. That you've allowed us to come out and openly and freely worship you. To sing songs about you and to come hear your word, Father, and I pray today that we would all be edified through that. I pray that your name would be glorified and that your gospel would be perfect. In Christ's name, amen. Now, Psalm 27 is called a psalm of trouble, but it's also called a psalm of confidence. Some believe, some uh, commentators believe that it's actually two psalms originally and they were mess, in a mess, kind of meshed up. But James McGregor Boyce says that in a symphony, two moods were brought together. You have confidence and you have concern, all in one song. And that perplexed some people that they, they, doesn't, the moods don't fit. But he calls it a symphony because those are two moods and two emotions or two feelings that we often feel at the exact same time. Confidence and concern. It was written by David. Uh, they, some think that it was written while he was fleeing from Saul, which would, ex which would make Saul much more powerful. Because if you see the time when he was fleeing from Saul, uh, he was fleeing and running and facing this radical injustice because 
He was just being obedient. He had done everything that he was called to do. He was doing everything he was supposed to do. And yet Saul sought after him to take his life. And it was believed that it was during a time like that that he penned this song. Now, none of us in here are, are fleeing for our life. None of us are being sought after. None of, no one's trying to take our head and put it on a platter. But we all face troubles and pains and, and suffering and persecution. And I, and I look at our church today and I know individuals who are facing pains and, and hurts of health issues or, or relationship issues, family issues, marital issues, job problems, loss of loved ones. This is a song that is applicable for us today. David starts off in the first five verses, and we see his confidence. He says, just in the first verse, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He describes the Lord in three ways. He says the Lord is light, the Lord is salvation, and the Lord is a stronghold. And when David is facing these unthinkable things, when he's surrounded by his enemy, when they're, when they're literally attempting to, to take his head, he doesn't respond by saying what he is. He responds by saying what the Lord is. He's not saying, I'm running, I'm hiding, I'm scared, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. He's not complaining. He's not saying that he's afraid. He's responding in a way that he's not saying, this is what I'm going through. Instead, he's saying, this is what the Lord is doing. This is who the Lord is. And that's profound because right here, David is proclaiming a gospel. And each day, each of us preach a gospel. This is the one that David was preaching in the, in the face of persecution. He says, the Lord is light. Light is symbolic. It means just, holy, righteous, pure, true, good. Light is dispels darkness, and darkness is symbolic for evil. He's saying that justice will win out. And David, as a shepherd, understands the importance of light. They didn't have street lights, they didn't have kerosene heaters, they didn't have Coleman lanterns or whatever. He understood the, 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 the purpose and the importance of a campfire as a shepherd. He knew that light was protection. And as a soldier, he knew that darkness was danger. The enemy lurked in the darkness. So when he says the Lord is light, he's saying that the Lord is protection and the Lord is safety. And he goes on and he says the Lord is salvation. He says the Lord is deliverance from evil, both external and internal. The Lord is, is, salvation, is deliverance from the world and the Lord is deliverance from my own sinfulness. And what he's saying here is that God doesn't merely rescue his people. He himself is the rescue. God isn't just a form or a type or an example of salvation. God is salvation. Then he goes on and says, the Lord is stronghold. He says, the Lord is the fortified city. He's a place of refuge. He's a place to run. He's a place of protection. And it's important to notice that, he, again, he's not stating that the Lord is a light, a salvation, and a stronghold. He's saying the Lord is light, is salvation and is the stronghold. This is not a form of what it is. This is what the Lord is. He is salvation. The Lord is life. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is stronghold. And we read that and we know that's true. That's what we preach every day, right? That's what we tell our co-workers. That's what we tell our neighbors. Come to Jesus. Come to the Lord. He'll protect you. He'll take care of you. He'll meet your needs. The Lord is this. The Lord is life. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is stronghold. But, is that a trivial knowledge for us? Do we coldly and, and apathetically just share that with people so often that it's just trivial knowledge? The Lord is light. I have a lighthouse picture in my house that has a verse under it that tells me the Lord is light. The Lord is salvation. I have a bumper sticker that says that. The Lord is stronghold. You know, I have, I have that t-shirt with the, the muscles on it that says the Lord is my strength. Is that just trivial knowledge for us? Is that where it ends? In a trivial way. The Lord is light. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is strong. That's true. But that's an incomplete truth. That's, that's what David's saying. But that's not all that David is saying. And if that's all that we're sharing, 
And we're guilty of sharing bad theology. Because we left the word out. Did you catch what we left out there? Is the, does David say the Lord is light? David says the Lord is my life. The Lord is my salvation. And the Lord is the stronghold of my life. That's a valuable message. That's a message that we miss. I think that's a message that we here at Community Baptist are guilty of missing. I know I've missed it. I stood up here in this pulpit after Connor's surgery, and I read to you from Job and how Job, or God said to Job, everything under the heaven is mine. And I found comfort in that because I look at that and I see God saying, I'm sovereign. If you're mine, I'll do what I want with you. But that's not the end of the message. The message is everything under heaven is mine. I'm his. He can do what he wants with me, but he's going to care for me. He's going to provide for me. He's going to protect me. I learned that lesson in a humble way from Connor. In Awana. He likes to change his verses every week in Awana. Sometimes he does it to be a pun. Sometimes he does it because it's easier to understand. Sometimes he'll say, instead of children obey your parents in the Lord, children disobey your parents in the Lord. And it's just being it's just being honorary, I know, but that one of those first verses that he learned, God loves us and sent his son. And Connor's like a rain man. All you got to do is say it to him once and just start repeating it. And then you sing it. And then you say it real slow. And then you say it real fast. And pretty soon he picks up on it. And 15 minutes he knows his verse. I wrestled with Caden for three days. But Connor, Connor can get that verse down pat. But he still, he tries to change it. So instead of saying, God loves us and sent his son, God loves me and sent his son. He's like, no, 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 it's God loves us and send his son. He's like, God loves me and send his son. No, 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 God loves us and send his son. He's like, okay, God loves me and send his son. So I just left it at that. I was like, okay, you improved on it. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave it at that. God does love you and send his son. And that's what David is saying here. He's saying the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. And the Lord is my stronghold. When theology is properly understood, it defines who God is, but it also defines who we are as God's people. He is sovereign, but he is sovereign over me. He is Lord, but he is my Lord. He is mine, but I am his. That is grace. He is my light, he is my salvation, and he is my strength by grace. He is what he is to me by grace. In that, we find our identity. We look to our spouse, we look to our children, our careers, our hobbies, and we try to find meaning and we try to find our identity. We look horizontally for what's already been given to us vertically. I can wake up to my wife, not because she is my identity, but because God is my identity. I can patient my children, or I can patiently parent my children. Not because they're my identity, but because God patiently parents me. I can face pains and I can face trials because God is sovereign Lord over those pains and those trials. And he is sovereign over me because he's not just Lord, he's my Lord. We have to apply that knowledge intimately. Our relationship has to be more than trivial Knowledge. It's like Ron was saying it last week. There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. David knew that the Lord was light and the Lord was salvation and the Lord was a stronghold. But more importantly, David knew that the Lord was his light, his salvation, and his stronghold. And for that reason, he was confident enough to ask in verse number one, of whom shall I be afraid? It's a question that answers itself. He says, my Lord is my protection. My Lord is my safety. Of whom? It's a sarcastic, it's a rhetorical question. Who shall I be afraid? Absolutely no one. My enemy surrounds me. They seek to devour me. They, they literally want to strip the flesh from my bones. I'm not afraid. I have no reason to be afraid of them. He was confident in the face of danger. And he could say in verse number 2 and 3, When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh... My adversaries and foes, 
It is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Listen to the brutality of that language. The evildoers assail me. They, they eat up Excuse me, they eat up my flesh. They seek to devour me. They don't want to just harm me. They don't want to just imprison me. They want to, they want to conquer me. They want to destroy me. They want my head on a platter so that the throne remains in Saul's hands and not mine. That's brutal language. He's comparing them. He says they eat up my flesh. He's probably not talking about cannibalism. We don't know. But he's comparing them to wild animals. That's gritty. That's brutal. He's abandoned. He's betrayed. He's suffering. He's alone. What can we take from that? We need to know that a biblical way of viewing life never requires us to deny reality. You don't have to minimalize the harsh realities of a fallen world. We don't have to live a life of denial. I had that conversation this week with a family member who was describing to me uh, this plague of suicides that they've had to encounter uh, with their friends and extended family and and neighbors and things. that In the past year, they've lost three people to suicide and and two more to an attempted suicide that that they survived. And and they they just looked at it and said, just lost. And they they just deny it and they're just sad. They just need to be happy. And they they don't grasp the, the fallen, the wickedness of the world, they're just they're, they're denying it. And they're denying what's happening and they're denying what people are feeling. They're denying what's going on in the world and they're just, it's not a big deal. No, no big deal. David is saying you don't have to deny this wickedness in the world. You don't have to deny this, this sinfulness. You don't have to deny the troubles and the suffering and the pain that you're going through. The Bible doesn't. The Bible is honest. It makes it perfectly clear that we live in a sinful, fallen world. Life will be difficult. We will suffer, and we shouldn't be surprised when it arises. We're going to hurt, and we don't need to ignore or deny it. But it also makes clear that there's no relationship or situation or pain or suffering that you're going through that is outside the transforming, delivering grace of God. Whatever you're going through is completely within the means of God's grace. Remember and write that down. A biblical faith never requires you to deny reality. David acknowledged his reality. And look at the message that he preached. It was a message of confidence in a sovereign Lord who he knew intimately. David trusted in the Lord, and for that reason, he had no fear of his enemies. And in verse 4, we see... That David's trust and his confidence were rooted in the presence of God. He says, One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. If you are facing evildoers, those who attack you and, and they want to eat up your flesh, what's that one thing that you would pray for? What's your one desire? What's your one thing? David, we would think, would pray for bigger and better weapons. They've got spears. I want bows and arrows and swords. They've got, they've got shields. Well, I want a fortress. He's, you would think he would pray for something bigger and better than what they already had. You think he might pray, Lord, just incinerate them. Send down fire. Consume my enemy. Maybe he should pray for deliverance. Lord, get me out of here. Pull me out of this place and place me in somewhere else safer away from my enemy. But he doesn't pray for those things. What's your one thing that you pray for? Oftentimes we pray a Jesus please prayer. Because our definition and our understanding of God is so small that we just say, Jesus please, if you love me, end this. Take me out of here. Change my circumstances. Fix this. Take this away. Give me this. They have this. I want this. And we say, Jesus, please. Just please fix it. But what's David's response? Everything in the world around him has fallen. The environment, mankind, marriage, family, health. He lives in a fallen, sinful world. How's he going to deal with that kind of world? 
David puts forth a single-minded appeal. He doesn't pray, Jesus, please, as we would expect he does. Instead, he says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Can you imagine? David is surrounded by his enemies. They literally want to take his life. And not in a a humane way. They want to destroy his very being. And he says, I just want to go to the temple. I just want to be in the presence of God. I just want to be in the tabernacle. I just want to be with him and gaze on his beauty. Would we say that? No, we would say, David, change your circumstances. Get out of danger. Escape the enemy. And then you can go to the temple. Then you can worship. Then you can pray. Then you can gaze upon his beauty. Get safe before you seek out the Lord. But David doesn't do that. In our language, David is simply saying, I I, I just want to experience the presence of God. I want to dwell with God. We're in the new covenant. We don't understand the temple fully. We don't, we don't, it doesn't, it's foreign to us that David might want to go to the temple to experience God. But, But in here, David is saying, God's in that temple. God's dwelling there, and I want to be in his presence. I want to be in his safety. I want to be under his protective guard. God fills that temple, and he fills it with his presence, and David's confession is, above all things, I want God. Above my own life, above my own safety, I want the Lord. The one thing that he asked for was the presence of God. What is your one thing? What is it that you desire? What is it that gives you peace and comfort? What is it? Your home, your coworkers, your, your job, your career, your hobbies, your spouse, your wife, your children. What is your one thing? Where is it that you take refuge from the wickedness of the world? Because if we can look at it in some other way, if, if we can say that having God is not that appealing. If just God is all we need, if that doesn't appeal to us, you know, I need everything else, I need, I need the luxuries of the world, then something's not right. Because if we hunger for God and we desire Him and we seek to gaze upon Him, that's all we'll need. He will be our safety. He will be our refuge, our protection, and our salvation. So David is confident in the first five verses. Look down in verses 6 through 14, and we see David's response. In the midst of troubles and pains and persecutions, David does not respond by giving up. He doesn't whine and complain. He doesn't sulk. He's not running. He's not breaking down. He's not failing. Instead, his confidence in the Lord causes him to respond in a different way. He worships. In verses, actually in verse 6 and 7, He says, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. He starts off by responding to persecution, responding to suffering by offering sacrifices and singing. And not just singing, shouting out to the Lord songs of praise. In the middle of pain, in the, in the face of death, David worships. In the midst of suffering, David worships. Just meditate on that for a minute and reflect on that. When was the last time you responded in that way? When was the last time you sat comfortably and you responded in worship? Let alone when things are not going our way and we just stand up and say, I'll praise you all day. David is doing that. And in verse number 7 through 12, he responds further with worship in prayer. David prays, and he prays in a way, and he prays for things that make it clear that he's still in danger. He's He's not out of the woods just yet. And he's praying in the heat of battle. And here's an example that we need to follow. In verse number 11 of the, you know, he starts in verse 7. With a prayer, but in verse number 11, he says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. How many times in the midst of suffering do we just stop and say, Lord, teach me your ways? There was a time early in our early years of faith that when we couldn't get enough, 
We devoured everything that we could. We had a voracious hunger for scripture and study and word. And we just wanted to dig deeper and know deeper truths. And we wanted to, to sit at the feet of, of, of other teachers and just listen and, and, and hear. And we just wanted to, to just, just soak in scripture and truth. But somewhere along the way, something happened. We got distracted by the physical pleasures of the world, and we became less of a student of the word and more of a tourist. Maybe we got discouraged by troubles. We get discouraged by troubles, and we felt that studying just didn't help it anymore. We stopped. We gave up. We got sidetracked by our own purposes and our own agendas, and now we don't have time to be a student anymore. And maybe we think we've arrived. I don't need to study this book anymore. I know everything I need to know. But David's prayer should be our prayer for two reasons. One, because of the depth of God's wisdom. If we gaze upon the beauty and the richness of God, we will see that his wisdom has no boundary. If we spend every second of every day for the rest of our lives digging deeper and studying more and seeking a deeper, more intimate relationship with God, we will have merely scratched the surface. We don't know all that we need to know, and we can't abandon that study. We need to pray, just as David prayed, teach me your ways. But the second reason we need to continue to pray and ask this for this is because we're in danger. There are voices of falsehood that cry out to us daily. They tell us who we are. They tell us how to live. They tell us what life is about, how to use our resources, how to conduct our relationships. They tell us what is true and what isn't. They tell you what your goal should be and how to accomplish it. These voices cry out and they tell us what we should be, what we should want, and what we should do. And it's easy to get captivated by those voices. But we need to remember that those voices are false. And we need to pray to be taught the ways of the Lord. How many people do you think cried out to David when he was running? Like, David, just, just give up. Just quit. Just give in. Stop chasing that. Stop giving up or stop, stop running from that. Just give up. How many voices told him false truths like that? We need to pray, teach me your ways, O Lord. And if we pray to know his ways, and we pray to know him more, and we desire above all else, above our own life, just to be in the presence of God, we will have a confidence and a trust that will prompt us to respond to our suffering and our pains with worship, just as David did. As you read through Exodus... You come to chapters de detailing the construction of the tabernacle. And you remember in those, ch those chapters, it was a very detailed and, and very intentional construction. It, they, there was a lot that went in just into the construction of the tabernacle. So imagine that as you envision David walking into that temple. He said, I, I, above all else, I just want to be in the temple with God. I just want to dwell in his presence. Now imagine what he's walking into, what he envisions himself seeing as he walks into that. It would be incredibly dark. There's no, there's no lamps in there or anything. It's just heavy curtains blocking out the light. The only light they have is the candlesticks. And he would go through the tabernacle and he would walk further in there and he would, it would be dark all around him. And he would so dark that you could feel that darkness and you, can, you just know... What, what, what's out there but you can't see it and you, you have very little light and he's walking through there and he's, he's, Im he's imagining these are my enemies in the darkness the Lord is my light and my salvation he's envisioning that as he walks through the temple and he would see the altar and he would see a God who cleanses us from our sins he would see a veil and he would be reminded that, that God is a God who is holy and righteous and, and just and he would know that behind that veil there was an ark, and on top of that ark, there was a place of atonement. And he would know that there is a God who saves and a God who delivers and a God who is merciful and gracious. And he would see these things in the tabernacle, and he would find comfort because he would know, hey, this is like my surroundings. I'm in darkness, but 
God is my protection. God is my safety. But the good news for us is that what David saw in the shadows there, we now see fully in Christ. David's one thing that he asked for was to be in the presence of the Lord in his house. We have the presence of the Lord in Christ. The temple is no longer necessary. Christ came and gave direct access to, us, to the Lord as our light, our salvation, and our strength and our stronghold. We are now the temple. Christ is now our personal, intimate Lord. That is why we are able to read this psalm and apply it. That's why we're able to look at this and say, Jesus Christ is my light. Jesus is my salvation. And Jesus is my stronghold. See, David understood that there exists in the universe one of stunning and glorious beauty. One so beautiful that everything he encountered and everything he experienced paled in comparison. He saw a beautiful Savior who was powerful and, and sovereign and glorious and graceful and patient and love and wisdom. And he said, no pains or troubles or stresses can match up to that beauty. You seek to take my life, but my Lord is my stronghold. You seek to strip the flesh from my bones, but my Lord is sovereign over me. You seek to consume me, but my Lord is my light. Nothing compares to the awesome power, strength, love, and grace of my Lord. We need to know that. You're only going, write this down, you're only going to understand the troubles in your life if you view those troubles through the beauty of your Redeemer. Because in that, you'll get to see God's providence. In that, you'll get to see his transforming grace molding you to the image of the Son. You're only going to understand the troubles in your life when you view these troubles through the beauty of your Redeemer. If you are here today and you don't know that Redeemer, these promises do not apply to you. Without Christ, you will be conquered. You will be devoured. The flesh will be stripped from your bones. Furthermore, if you're here today and you don't know that Redeemer, you are that enemy. You are not on the defense against an offensive enemy. You are the offender. But the good news is that he is a gracious Redeemer. So I implore you to repent and fall at the feet of him. Come to him, begging for mercy, begging for grace, begging that he would be not just salvation, but your salvation. And if you're here today and you do know the Redeemer, I encourage you to look at the eminence of the Lord. This is something we're guilty of here at this community Baptist. We know theology but sometimes we make theology trivial we see a transcendent sovereign holy just lord and we put him up on a pedestal which he needs to be on but we don't dare approach it christ is not just a transcendent lord christ is eminently involved in our life he is light he is salvation he is stronghold, but apply it intimately. He is, my, he is Chris's light. He is Chris's salvation. He is Chris's stronghold. Is he yours? This transcendent Lord of the universe who orchestrates and ordains all of creation is sovereign over you. And for that reason, you can confidently trust him. I know that I look at our church and I know many of us are many many are hurting. There's health issues. There's there's there are serious health issues. There's marriage issues. There's job and career issues. There's relationships and, and family and, and financial woes and, and family troubles. And I know that we're going through pains and sufferings, but know that Christ is Lord over that and view those things through the beauty of his redemption. And I'll leave you with this. Verse 14. This is hard. It's one of those easier said than done verses. Because after David says, 
the Lord is my light, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is my stronghold. After he says they literally want to strip the flesh from my bones, after he says I want to be in the presence of the Lord, he comes and he says in verse 13, first of all, he says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He's confident. They're going to take his life, but he says, I'm confident that I'm going to make it out of this all right. I desire to be in the presence of the Lord, and I know that I will be in the presence of the Lord. And for that reason, he comes to verse 14, and he says, and this is, this is a bittersweet counsel for those who are suffering. He says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Spurgeon said of this verse, he says, Wait at his door with prayer. Wait at his feet with humility. Wait at his table with service. Wait at his window with expectancy. Wait on the Lord. I don't, I don't know everything that you're going through, but God does. And he is providentially reigning over that. There is a purpose that it is happening in your life. Wait upon the Lord. You may not get your way. You may not get the, the deliverance from it that you want. You may not get the escape from it from the, that you want. But you can confidently say, if you know him, you can confidently say, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord because I waited on him. I waited on him to act. I didn't sulk. I didn't run. I didn't fall down in fear. I didn't give in. I waited upon the Lord. And then you can say, He is sovereign. He is protection. He is my light, my salvation, and my stronghold. Whom shall I fear? Let's pray. Father God, we, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your example that, that is provided in David. That we know, Lord God, that you reign over us, that you are Lord of the cosmos, Father, that you orchestrate the, the, the movement of the stars, Father, but you are intimately and actively involved in the lives of your people. And Lord, I pray that we take confidence in that, that we, that we find peace in that, and that we look to you and we shout out to the community around us that God is not just, you're, you're not just a a, a, a strength or a salvation or a light, but you are ours and you, you redeemed us and that we view the world through that beauty. We thank you. Jesus name.